what I forget. Good, okay. First speaker is Chris. Uh, Chris Paulson is uh, associate professor at Ohio State University in the Department of History of Art. Uh, she's a specialist in contemporary art. Uh, her book is titled uh, uh, Here, There, Telepresence, Touch, and uh, Art at the Interface. Uh, it, had, it has won awards. Uh, she has written on experimental television, artificial intelligence, net art, and many other topics in uh, several journals. Okay, the podium is yours. I'm going to disappear to give you maximum bandwidth, uh, but I am here. Hopefully my internet doesn't die. Thanks, Pierre. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, just flag me if you can see my presenter uh, tools. I hope you don't. Um, so let me go here. Okay. Looks, looks blank. Black. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's yes. what you should see. Great, thanks. Um, so, um, for decades, virtual reality seemed to be on the edge of emergence, promising to deliver immersive out-of-body experiences to users empowered with the ability to interact and alter their cinematic surrounds. But it wasn't until the mid 20 teens, as we all remember, uh, that VR headsets began to enter the consumer market and uh, the rarefied white cubes of uh, the uh, galleries. Contrary to the interactivity that the technology seemed to imply and to which a large market of the home users and gamers demanded, most VR experiences that you'll see in gallery spaces are not equipped with controllers and are purposely structured to produce an experience of immersion without agency. This talk outlines some of the distinctive features of gallery-based VR and begins to describe the subject position created for users by immersive VR experiences in galleries who enter sometimes disorienting, even dissociative states while witnessed by a scrutinizing crowd anticipating their own turn to exist between two worlds. So what I'm presenting here are some beginning gestures, just starting to think through some different kinds of experience and the kinds of passivity that seem to be produced in uh, these gallery-based works. One of my main goals is to think through how these gallery-based experiences are different from home uses of VR for gaming primarily, and how these experiences differ from cinema. And what I wanna to get to in the end is to understand how the body struggles with navigating two embodied environments at the same time. Proprioception, sometimes referred to as the sixth sense, is the sense of self-movement and body position. And I'm interested in what this current crop of uh, museum-based works do to us proprioceptively and how this relates to our expectations of agency and the powers accorded to us as users. So I'm gonna begin with some observations and these are generalizations um, and there'll be exceptions of course, but for the moment those might just emphasize uh, the rule. I'm gonna be talking exclusively about works um, that have appeared since around 2016 when mass market VR rigs such as the Oculus became commonplace in both galleries and home environments. And everything I'm going to be talking about today appeared in a high profile museum, biennial or gallery exhibition, conventional art settings that is. Uh, none of these works are available for home or private use. And because of this and some other factors I'll mention, I'm working from memory with no recordings and very few images uh, to help me as I go, which is um, a pretty unusual circumstance for someone who writes about media these days. The limited ephemeral experience uh, feels quite rare at this point. And certainly I think that's a factor in the way these works uh, affect uh, the viewer. Art VR works tend to lack controllers, as I already mentioned. And, and as you can see in these images, um, this in many ways makes sense as it prevents users from backing out into the main menu or changing any settings, but it also creates a particular kind of VR experience, one in which you can move your head and uh, your viewpoint, but you can't do a lot else. Uh, and these works tend to enforce a viewer who doesn't have a lot of control over her movement in space. In fact, um, the most tactile experience that you might have uh, in one of these works is actually getting kind of set up in it uh, by the attendant who uh, administers the experience to you. And so what you get in these works is a strange kind of embodiment that can sometimes feel like 360 degree cinema. And I think in many ways, these works are 
really quite close to cinema, whether realist or modernist. They often either suture the viewer into a very particular viewpoint, or more rarely, they produce a quite intentional Brechtian alienation effect that prevents identification. Um, Gallery-based VR works, another observation here, are rarely multi-user. Uh, that is, even if there are multiple headsets and installation, as you might see here, it's quite rare that you appear to your peers in the world, um, in that world. Co-presence is, of course, very common in gaming and home use, and I think it's one of the most compelling and interesting aspects of VR. Um, and as you can imagine, if, if these works relied on having other people in there, then even at a setup like this, which was at the Venice Biennale, which is usually quite crowded, um, you might find yourself uh, alone in it. But um, this is not to say that just because you don't necessarily interact with others in these works, that there aren't social aspects to gallery-based VR experiences. And in fact, these experiences tend to be to so tightly guarded and usually with no simulcasting of what's going on in headset of the user's view, and often so oppressively administered in, in my experience, causing really long lines. One spends a lot of time looking at the people ahead and making assumptions about one, one's own experience will be like from what one observes. And a few things come out of this scenario, the images that circulate of the work works are not actually of the works, but of people wearing headsets or engaging with the sculptural supports of the installation or standing in line. And this is much of what I'll be showing you today. But, and this is what you'll see in the images. And because of this, I become tempted in many ways to think about the viewer's body engaged with the sculptural supports of the work as the primary spectacle of many uh, VR works. And it's certainly what circulates as documentation. So there's this very particular social situation around gallery-based VR. Rather than being hidden in the dark, sharing a collective social experience typically associated with cinema, viewers of VR in the museum find themselves and their embodied acts of viewing on display for others who are queuing up for their turns. We can set this against the more traditional cinematic experience, and I'm called back to Roland Barthes' 1975 essay, Leaving the Movie Theater, where he too seems to see much of the experience being housed in the social architectural context, uh, but to different ends. He writes, whenever I hear the word cinema, I can't help thinking hall rather than film, so, so the, the building or the, the screening environment. The experience of watching a film is a lot then about that immersive context of the theater itself. Bart described the experience as a state of hypnosis where his body, immersed in the anonymity of the dark, becomes sleepy and soft and limp. There's what he calls a diffused eroticism of being in the cinematic cocoon. The body's freedom generated in this particular urban dark and enhanced, is enhanced by the adjacency of other shadowy spectators. So in using VR in the gallery, uh, even if it's more cinematic than interactive, uh, it's structurally different than cinema because of the way the spectator is also positioned as a spectacle. This is not to say that watching users in VR headsets is only something that happens in the gallery. And I'm remembering I do have one video here. Uh, the proliferation of VR fail videos points out that watching others experience the strange embodiment of VR, where you're proprioceptively navigating a virtual environment while subject to the constraints and obstacles of an unseen or even forgotten physical one has become an entertainment in itself. Despite the fact then that viewers of gallery-based VR are independent of the scenes they witness, that is not actually um, interacting with them, they're not cocooned as a cinema goer or, the, or like the obscure and inscrutable flaneur who according to Baudelaire is at the center of the world yet remains hidden from that world. VR viewers are closer to that opposite of the flaneur, what Benjamin calls the badeau, the rubbernecker or the gawker, the subject who's both witness to the spectacle and is absorbed by that external world, which moves him to the point of intoxication and ecstasy. Wendy Chun has adopted this term, the gawker, to describe web users who believe they're super agents, while in fact, they are always objects of someone else's gaze and informatic capture. In order to operate, she writes, the internet user turns every spectator into a spectacle. Users are more like gawkers, viewers who become spectacles through their actions rather than flaneurs. Users are used as they use. Certainly there's a lot that's similar here, but users of VR differ, I think, from the flanner and the gawker as described by Chun, in that they're immersed in a different spectacle than the one they're absorbed by. They're split between these two simultaneously and simultaneous and differently embodied spectacles. 
And so this is what I'm trying to think through this split, inhabiting two spectacles that are nested one within the other. You have the user being immersed in the spectacle that's delivered in the headset, um, and then the user being at the center of a spectacle witnessed by those in the surrounding space. And these two spectacles are mutually exclusive. The crowd can't see what's on the headset, and that headset blocks the user from uh, the crowd of watchers. Media scholar Janet Murray has described VR as producing what she calls a kind of double consciousness in which users are aware of both their physical and virtual environment simultaneously. And I think this term is a little unfortunate, um, an unfortunate choice, but what she describes here, I think really gets to this complicated experience. And as we sh shall see, proprioception is at the heart of it. She writes, Putting on the VR apparatus signals to us that we are entering an inverted human-authored reality. It is this signaling that lets us constrain our attention to what we see within the headset and what we can interact with via the controllers while tuning out other sensory input and, and overlooking contradictions in the representations before us. But we retain awareness that our immersive cocoon exists as a subset of a much larger and more complex reality of lived experience. It is in fact this double consciousness that makes VR so thrilling. Our sense that the virtual world uh, seems so real despite our knowledge that our feet are still planted in this world. Murray's description here is well taken. Even while totally immersed, we maintain at least a subtle awareness of our physical location when using the headset. Though again, those blooper reels do show that displacement can be very effective. And we might become most aware of our surroundings when we crash into them. And this is part of the thrill, she writes, to realize that you are grounded and oriented in two simultaneous and mismatched worlds. Scott Richmond discusses this in the cinematic context of his fantastic book, Cinema's Body, Bodily Illusions. In it, he's writing particularly about films that cause the viewer to experience an embodiment that's radically other from what they've experienced as beings bound to this earth, as well as what they are currently experiencing in their seats in a movie theater. So in a film like Huron's Ga Gravity, one has to, he writes, submit to a movement that is not one's own, to the cinema's disordering and reordering of perception and its ongoing modulation of one's proprioception. Proprioception, what he calls, or what he calls proprioceptive aesthetics, lies at the heart of cinema as an aesthetic medium and a technical system in both its historical and contemporary uses. That's part of, that's his argument in the book. And perhaps it is this modulation, in this modulation of proprioception, that we can see some of the most intense familial lineages developing between cinema and VR, in that both firmly root one into an anchored embodied place and then, and and those that cut the viewer loose. So I'm hoping, uh, I'm hopefully going to have time to show you example of kind of both of these types, ones that ground and then ones that kind of separate, uh, pull apart the two bodies. Richmond helpfully defines proprioception as one of three registers of perception. Exeroception, the perception of the world uh, beyond our bodies, typically interpreted by our five senses. Interoception, the perception of the interior of the body indexed by uh, visceral sensations, that is sensations of the internal organs, such as the bladder or the stomach and so on. And last proprioception, um, which names the perceptual processes that mediate between those two um, and coordinate the interior body to an external world. Richmond in his book looks at extreme, almost limit cases of cinema um, to call attention um, to how proprioception is actually engaged in kind of all cinemata, cin cinematics. But one not need to venture so far with VR since almost every work calls to attention these negotiations. And I think not just in, in the visual content, but again, the, the nausea, the imbalance and disorientation that are often part of the VR experience and, and, and emphasize that, that intero, um, interoception. So now I want to bring together what have emerged, I think, as, as two threads here. And each of them involves a double. Uh, so bear with me. And I'm showing this fail video again, because I actually think this gets to some of it. We have this proprioceptive doubling as we navigate between our sensory experience of the virtual world while still beholden at the same time to the constraints of our physical surrounding. And then we have the second set of doubled spectacles where we intersect with our social world, as I discussed earlier in gallery based VR, we're having an immersive experience of a spectacle while also being at the center of another spectacle from which we're at least temporarily closed off. 
So what I'm interested in is the compounding here of the physical and the social disorientation in VR. Interactivity, as Murray noted in that quote that I showed you, uh, is what enables the user to put the immediate physical context into the background. Um, and interactivity is often really limited um, in, in gallery-based VR works and very purposefully limited. One is just there often to watch. So the works I wanna talk about now ask for a kind of surrender and submission to the experience and, and its multiple pulls. And I'll just wanna quickly note that the works I'm talking gonna talk about um, are somewhat sens sensational um, and there's a lot to talk about with them, but I'm limiting my comments really narrowly just to these physical and social worlds and, and how those intersect. And, and you'll see from what I show that, that there's a lot, um, a lot to talk about um, beyond this. So uh, Jordan Wolfson's Real Violence is the first one I want to talk about. It's a rather well-known gallery-based VR work. Uh, in some ways, I regret giving it more attention. Um, it was included in the Whitney Biennial and as such got a lot of traffic um, and, and you know, was written about quite extensively, both because of the novelty of a VR work being in a major exhibition like the Whitney Biennial in 2017, but also because of its infamously scandalous content. And for those blissfully unfamiliar, the user watches a very highly realistic in, um, avatar of Wolfson beat a passive man uh, to what one would assume is death on the street. And I'm showing you a rogue still uh, that is circulating of this, um, of this work, but it's, it's a very tightly controlled um, in terms of its images. Um, the experience in it is upsetting, but it's also quite familiar. Um, it's not unlike scenes you might see in an HBO drama or in a popular video game. The difference perhaps is our embodied position within the scene and within the museum, uh, as well as our total passivity in what is a typically interactive medium. And the entry into this work, I think, is very notable in these proprioceptive ways. Um, it's a highly orchestrated event. It's more like getting service at an Apple store uh, than any typical art experience. After a very long wait in a queue, uh, watching those ahead of you, a helpful attendant ushers you into the experience, cleaning the headset, uh, and manipulating your body into the apparatus. You know, it is pre-COVID, it was very physical, I found. Um, and once sealed off from seeing the room that you're in, the attendant helps you into headphones but then further isolate you from your uh, immediate context. You're instructed to hold on to a waist high bar, uh, kind of as if you're at a ride on an amusement park. Um, and it's a rather formal affair, tightly controlled, uh, really regimented. And the majority of one time, one's time is spent in the queue or getting set up rather than actually watching the work, which is quite short, it's just a few minutes and it has a very definite ending. So the VR experience, which I'm describing from now quite a distant memory, uh, begins with a view of clouds as if one is looking up at the sky, even if you're facing ahead. And so there's this kind of disorientation of trying to get yourself, figure out where you are in the space. Um, the camera then rotates backwards, giving the viewer the feeling that you've just like kind of flipped heels overhead. And um, it can be a bit sickening and you need that, that, that handlebar uh, perhaps. Um, and when the world steadies, you find yourself facing Wolfson and his future victim, as you see here. And at this point, the user becomes very firmly grounded in the space, standing on the sidewalk just a few feet away from them. And then Wolfson commences to, to beat this already somewhat bedraggled man with a baseball bat. And the viewer is given very few choices. One can't get closer, engage, or intervene. The options are to watch, to turn away, or to take off the headset. And if you make it through the, the full run of it, the scene fades to black and uh, you get static uh, on the audio and you surrender your headset to the attendant who keeps the line moving. During the long lead up to this work, one can't help but attend to what others are doing to see if they flinch or look away or take off the headset off immediately. Some gasp or you know, fruitlessly try to cover their eyes. Others watch totally unmoved. The content is gross and it generated a lot of outrage and indignation. And it's obviously quite intentionally crafted to call attention to both the act of watching in and out of the headset. Despite not being interactive, it seems quite easy to see how Murray's double consciousness of VR is at play here. The long lead up and the careful administration of the experience um, and one's placement in the headset, the hand on the banister, and even the brevity of the work keeps one aware of the physical and social environment in the gallery, even if it is uh, there are these very disorienting moves at the beginning. 
Wolfson demonstrates uh, his full control over the viewer in this too. Uh, he decouples one's viewpoint from any bodily motions in the beginning and uh, through that initial somersault. And then he locks the viewer into an immobile place in the world where you can turn away um, your head, but you, you can't kind of get away from the world or do anything uh, to it. And I'm going to tr try to be brief here. And there's a few works that I would want to talk about that I think uh, are counters to this. Um, but um, I want to talk about uh, this one, Cecil Meinsha Hansen's Second Sex War Zone from 2016, which I think does something really different, uh, in which our emplacement and our embodiment in both worlds are radically disrupted. What's going to remain the same and consistent, though, is that the user in this work um, still doesn't have any typical interactive agency. But this leads not to a passive immobility, but to a kind of surrender in which it's easy to forget where you are in physical and in social space. They take on you, uh, this work and, and, and others kind of like it. I th I'm thinking of Jacob B. Satterwhite as, as someone else who I'd bring up here on these endless looping rides. Uh, and they ask you to see from a position other than your own and one that you can't quite map onto yourself. And in the process, um, you kind of uh, come apart proprioceptively. The work I want to introduce here is um, as I said, second, Hansen's Second Sex War Zone, and there's a lot to say about the content. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be somewhat brief. Um, Hansen customizes an off-the-shelf, royalty-free, female-presenting avatar, Ava 3.0, which is designed for virtual pornography, and through it, one's thrust into this very physical uh, sexual encounter that has uh, a lot of very disorienting details. Uh, one of the most notable differences between Second Sex War Zone and real violence, though, is, is just how one enters the work. Rather than being ushered into the experience by an attendant and primed by watching others go through a set experience, the user helps herself into the work by climbing onto a vegan leather bean bag and putting on the headset. The user immediately is situated inside the Ava avatar, which has been rechristened Dick Girl, no doubt because of the genitalia props that structure the action and the embodiment in the work. The user is in the avatar, but just inside and misaligned with the avatar. So you can look down through the eye sockets and see actually like the bones and body and shell of, of the avatar um, to look down at your, your lower body. And so it's as if you're wearing a mask that sits slightly out from the surface of your, of your body. And through this avatar, you're engaged sexually with another avatar. And this other avatar has mirrored eyes in which you see your own reflection and you look just like they do. And, and this creates an unrelentingly chaotic scene. The action is really propulsive and elements are constantly changing. Sometimes you're with the other avatar and it's like a twin and other times there's a chaotic burst of action that reveals you to be with something else, this amorphous object that's like a hunk of clay or burnt meat. And at times your skin or the other avatar skin appears in this material as well. And, and um, I'm wrapping up in just a sec. Um, it's hard to tell whose body is whose, and if you're seeing everything from just within the first person perspective. So there's this confusion of inside and outside. You see the inside of your own body as well as the outside of another avatar and your own reflection in that avatar's eyes. Um, so there's this real confusion of kind of where you are in space uh, and, and what's going on. And, and it also runs as a loop. It's never ending, never resting. And your avatar body moves regardless of how you position your own physical body. And so your job is to keep up with it rather than to control it. So you're often rotating and rolling and twisting around on the bee bag just to keep everything in view or to get in line with what you see as your own eyeballs. So the Hansen doesn't give the user any control over the action, uh, just any more control than Wilson does, but the orientation is much different. Rather than being something like your own body positioned as a witness or enabler of an atrocious action, one steps into another's body and is given the opportunity to inhabit the actions of another with their pleasures and their desires. One loses or loosens control of yourself. And in the confusion, it's hard to know what's oneself and what's, one other, what's the other. Um, everything's just slightly mismatched. And moreover, you really lose track of your own body in the physical space. Typically, one would just plop down on the beanbag in a sitting position and put the headset on, but quickly you have to reposition yourself to sync up with the action of the avatar. I know I had to immediately roll over and face backwards to see what was happening. And with all the constant twisting and repositioning and changing, it's kind of a surprise when you take off the goggles and see where you are and disentangle yourself uh, from the cord. 
And additionally, as I said, the headset is just lying there. There's no one to help you or coach you. And many visitors approach with trepidation, feeling vulnerable, or as if some, you're doing something illicit even before entering this kind of illicit work, uh, such as freely touching museum objects without permission. And you might enter alone and then return to a crowd watching you or just the opposite. There's no cue. People just mill around and approach when they wish. So second sex war puts the viewer into something like a fugue state where you experience a loss of awareness of your own identity and a flight from your usual uh, body and, and its desires and actions and knowledges. Um, so one might lose control in this work of where their body is in space and time, but the triggers in it, uh, both the erotic ones and, and abject ones, really proprioceptively stitch uh, your physical body, um, uh, it, you know, uh, it's into this experience. So um, you have this extraception and interoception being mediated there. And so the experience is both really disorienting and deeply felt. Uh, Chun used that figure of the Bado, the gawker, the rubbernecker, to dispel the myth of a super agent in digital spaces. High on the ecstasy of false power, the user doesn't realize that she's actually a gawker, the object of someone else's gaze and informatic capture. Gallery-based VR works quickly short circuit any fantasy of being a super user, activating uh, kind of all of these alienation functions of being, being watched. Users are disempowered and on display as Wolfson's work so clearly dramatizes. But I wonder if it's the same thing we can say that's happening in Hansen's or for example, Jacoby Satterwhite's who I mentioned. Certainly users don't have power and any fantasy of it, and they are potentially on display through the lack of administration, of, though the lack of administration makes it a little less the case. These VR works engage the viewer's body in a constant movement that's not connected to mastery or agency, and one's proprioceptive grounding is constantly disturbed and renegotiated, kind of shaking both levels of that double consciousness in VR. So I'm sorry I went over time. Uh, that's it. Oh, very good. Very good presentation. Yeah, let me turn on my video again. <clears throat> um, yeah, excellent. Anybody has questions? Please post them in the in the Q and A. Um, I have uh, one question related sure. to your, your talk, and then a, a broader question. Um, when uh, when you were talking um, or uh, quoting uh, the the idea of the double consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really true that in, when you are experiencing virtual reality, you are conscious of, uh, of the, the physical space because you don't really know what's going on in the physical space. Yeah. Uh, if I am in a museum uh, and I'm, I'm admiring a painting or I'm just walking past the painting, I can hear people commenting on the painting. I, know, I can see the security guard if I am at the Louvre, I, I can't even really see the Mona Lisa because they put all these barriers. And um, people. So, right. If you're in a gallery and it's, um, I know it's an opening, there's people drinking, chatting. Yeah. So, well, you're always so, negotiating your body around other things and right. you're aware, you're, you're doing all of those levels of uh, proprioceptive kind of navigation. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not sure I agree with, uh, Janet Murray, um, in, in part, you know, because we become aware of what's happening in VR, I think, when something trips us up, um, there can, you know, when you crash into something or uh, lean, on, lean on a table that's not there, which happened to someone I was playing virtual ping pong with not too long ago, um, you realize like, oh, you've, you've misperceived um, what's going on and you've taken, you've taken one's you've substituted the virtual extraceptions for what you thought were a physical space. And, and there are these disorderly things that happen, which is why those fail videos are funny because you get immersed in something and you forget about it. Um, you know, and I think what Murray is saying is that that's part of the thrill of it to realize that you're um, forgetting about the world around you. Um, and so, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure you're always aware of it. And I think there can be some shocks. I think that the content in, um, in Wolfson's work and in Hansen's work makes you uh, keep the social in mind because it is so, um, uh, I don't know, with, with, with um, Wolfson's work kind of so uh, 
upsetting and and transgressive and with Hansen's work kind of so eroticized that you're kind of aware like, oh, I'm being watched by other people or uh, I'm in a public space while I'm looking at something that seems a lot like pornography, you know, or, or has elements of it and, 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 and cite, cites it, you know, so I do think there's something about the social world that comes in because of the extreme nature of, of the content in them as much as any of the um, kind of aesthetic or um, tactile or immersive uh, qualities in the, the built environment. Yeah, yeah. 